Welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Here is Munir Alazuzi from easymedicaldevice.com. And today we'll talk about IVDR class D devices. And I have with me Andreas Tange from uh, Chief Suite. So Andreas, welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Yes, hello Munir. Thank you for having me today. Great. Um, I want just to start by uh, congratulation of the 100th certificate that your Chief has uh, certified for Class D devices. I think, yeah, it's a lot of pride, if I can say, after all this, uh, the time that IVDI is in place now that, yeah, you are really uh, making a lot of progress with the certifications. Yeah, thank you very much for that. And uh, actually, the 100th uh, certificate that was issued uh, last week on 5th of uh, July, And uh, today we are one week later and we have uh, actually already issued four. So, I mean, we are really uh, getting up to speed uh, both, um, I mean, on all sides and manufacturers uh, are really submitting a lot of files. Um, our operational teams are up to speed and reviewing. And also we have, uh, you know, the certification body teams who then finally uh, do the uh, final check and then the Uh, issue of the certificate also that is uh, running uh, yeah smoother and smoother yeah so so yeah it's it's indeed a quite a, a big achievement and uh, yeah we are we are happy about that exactly and it's, it's why i i wanted to have this podcast with you because i, I suppose and it's what i i was ass assuming that after 100 certificates You maybe have some good advice to provide to some manufacturers, some tips or some issues that they are always falling on. And maybe it can be great to, to share that. But before we share that, I just want you maybe to remind again uh, to people about this IVDR timeline, because we have had some changes recently due to a proposal that was voted now. And what's, what's the situation now with this timeline? It's again pushed, etc. cetera. So uh, what, what's the situation from your side? Yeah, the situation is uh, that now, uh, I mean, this this proposal for new transition timelines for, for, um, uh, for the transition from IVDD to IVDR, um, that is uh, around since the uh, beginning of this year. And it took quite some time until this uh, became really into into law, and that just happened um, this week on uh, on uh, Tuesday, I believe. Um, this is now uh, a regulation, and that just means uh, that uh, for the devices uh, who are upclassified um, to class D, class C, uh, class B, uh, that they have uh, even longer now time um, to be uh, transferred. Uh, from uh, from the IVDD to the to the IVDR. Important is that uh, manufacturers uh, observe the times um, they need to uh, by by when they need to uh, submit the application um, to the uh, notified body. Um, it is uh, also critical that uh, this whole transition uh, timelines only apply for those devices who have a declaration of conformity signed uh, in uh, 2000 and until before uh, May 2022. So um, in the end, uh, it provides even longer, uh, you know, um, yeah, transition time. Yeah. Um, we believe, uh, yeah, I mean, As, as we as we just discussed with the class D, I mean, the pace has picked uh, up quite significantly and we are quite confident that we can manage uh, uh, quite a big amount of uh, certifications, the same as other notified bodies. So whether it was really uh, needed to that extent is uh, yeah debatable. Anyway, we have it now. It is uh, enforced and um, yeah, we can uh, we can deal with it. I, I I agree, and, and mainly the manufacturers. What we have to remind to the manufacturers is that this is the the deadline for you to obtain your certificate. It's not the deadline where you have to start to think of it and to start to transition. So, uh, how long? I mean, do, do you have a timeline of how long the certification for IVD maybe class D devices takes? Like, is it one year, eighteen months, twenty four months, or yeah? Yeah, I think this is very much depending on the maturity of the manufacturer. So also now when we talk, for example, class D devices, yeah. Unearth the pulse of the MedTech world with MedTech Conf. 
a dynamic platform featuring global events on medical devices, biologicals, IVD, and pharmaceuticals. Stay informed, stay ahead, connect, share, and elevate your knowledge. Become an official sponsor, make your event shine on the map. MedTech Conf, your key to the MedTech universe. Remember, the future is now, and it's at your fingertips with MedTech Conf. Uh, for a manufacturer who has experience to work with a notified body, who has maybe also already issued uh, or, or gone through a conformity assessment, uh, maybe uh, list A under IVDD or even maybe a class D already, I think uh, this can be done in a, in 12 months or, or even, even less. Yeah. However, for manufacturers who have never worked with a notified body and where we have maybe no common specifications, um, maybe a upclassified uh, class D device for, for syphilis or something. I mean, that uh, the hurdle and the time uh, to get through is significantly longer, yeah, because uh, there's less, less experience on both sides. Um, I mean, syphilis is, uh, uh, you know, something where also notified bodies have not uh, worked too long with, um, and also manufacturers. Uh, if they don't have uh, experiences notified bodies, they need to learn, okay, how do we uh, perform um, the uh, performance evaluation study? How do we uh, put together a technical documentation? Um, and how do we, uh, yeah, communicate and work with a notified body? So this 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 is a quite uh, uh, an important factor in, in uh, looking at that. So it's uh, a bit difficult to generalize, but... Uh, yeah, I think uh, for for experienced uh, partnership, this can be uh, less than a year. And for for you know, uh, if, so to say, a new couple of uh, manufacturer and notified bodies, this can uh, take one and one point five years or, or longer. Yeah. Yeah, so they have really to take this into consideration because it's not only uh, submitting the date of submission because you have all the round of discussion questions that can be uh, going back and forth and yeah, can take also yeah. a lot of time. So yeah, they, 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 yeah. this is not a, a, a simple process also. Yeah, um, I think exactly. I mean, one thing is also, um, you know, it is, it is really advisable to get uh, into contact with the notified body early on and to discuss uh, early on, okay, when can the notified body e uh, ex expect uh, the technical file to be submitted? Because of course, our people are not just sitting uh, in the office and waiting for things to come in. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they are scheduled, they are busy. So uh, if we know early on, okay, um, in uh, let's say in, in a couple of months, we will expect this file, then we can plan our resources ahead. So um, that is uh, very, very uh, important um, to know and understand and uh, that we can then stay in discussions and uh, as long and, and go along with the, uh, with, these, uh, with the planning of the submission and planning also of uh, uh, when the manufacturers can receive the answers and so on and so forth. So, yeah, it's correct. So this this is really important if we want to have a smooth uh, collaboration. So here we are trying to focus today on class D devices. So what is the timeline for class D? So when uh, the manufacturer should submit, I mean, should normally reserve their uh, certificate? Yeah, I mean, uh, the I think the uh, I mean, right now we have uh, the the next let's say critical uh, timeline for a class d submission is uh, the 1st of october okay. and uh, why is that so um on 1st of october uh, the eu reference labs are formally declared functional okay. and uh, with the uh, existence of functional eu reference labs um there is one step which needs to be taken before the class d certificate can be um issued and that is uh, the uh, verification of the performance, uh, which needs to be done by the EU reference lab. So this is a this is a, 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 yeah um, an activity. Um, if the application is done uh, until thirtieth of September, this uh, verification by the reference labs has to be done in the first five years uh, certification yeah. cycle. Yeah, so there is plenty of time to do it until the first EU certificate expires. But from 1st of October, it needs to be done before the certificate can be issued. And that uh, will certainly add some time 
to the uh, conformity assessment. So this is, so to say, the next uh, important uh, deadline. It's not a deadline. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's an um, advice. It's it's better to do it's it an advice. the 30th exactly. of September. Yeah. Yeah. So that uh, mainly uh, you have uh, the advice is mainly to do it before the 30th of September than the 1st of uh, October. Exactly. Um, this is this is right. Mm -hmm. So um, now that we have a clear understanding of this first timeline, the the only thing that uh, is a follow up question is about the this URL. So the European uh, laboratories here. Uh, we have it's needed mainly for class D devices that. That's right. The URLs, uh, their uh, uh, task is then to perform the batch verification. So that means uh, any batch, uh, as manufactured by the uh, by the by the manufacturer, need to be then um, submitted uh, or sent to the reference lab, and then uh, they need to be tested whether they um, are within the specifications. And uh, this is uh, quite a logistic. Uh, yeah, effort, yeah. because uh, manufacturers need to set up their devices at the reference lab and then, of course, need to send these um, these uh, batches there. So each In batch, home, each batch one by one. So each time you should change batches, for example, batch A, yes. then is uh, yes. 100 pieces. You have to send maybe one sample or two samples. And this then batch B, you have to send again two samples, etc., etc. Yes, this is correct. And uh, this is then depending on the manufacturer, how they define their batches. But um, this is the same procedure as it is already done under the IVDD for list A devices. Yeah, so um, that is nothing new in principle. Yeah, what is new now that we have uh, new laboratories uh, which are newly designated. Yeah, and um, so uh, they uh, they this this process under IV, IVDR is uh, now being established. Yeah? And so you have five. You have five laboratories actually, if I remember, five or six. Plus, there was a, a request for more laboratories. So, is five yes. laboratories for all the world, or uh, so we have? Uh, we have not. I mean, uh, we have uh, a number of uh, laboratories um, uh, designated. This is correct. They do not cover all types of class D devices. Yeah, yeah? exactly. Yeah. Also, so yeah. we have we have some devices. I mean, even currently, you know, uh, uh, notified bodies are certifying class Ds without uh, EU reference labs. So they basically perform now the batch verification in an alternative way, either based on a, on a, a review of QC documents, uh, possibly also by a witness testing on the manufacturer side. Uh, there are several me uh, methodologies which uh, can be done. So it's happening already now, the batch verification, but it's not in the, let's say, original intended way by the EU reference labs. So from 1st of October, these uh, labs, uh, which are now uh, known for these uh, specific um, uh, device uh, types, are uh, in place, and uh, they will then do these uh, batch verifications. And uh, they will test it. They will report uh, the results to the notified body, and then the notified body uh, will issue then a batch uh, certificate. Okay. Um, anything else about the laboratories? Well, I think, um, as I said, uh, we we don't have the labs for all types of devices, but uh, that doesn't matter so much because uh, notified bodies are anyway already doing uh, alternative batch verification, so they can um, step in or continue doing this for these types. Where we don't have the labs. Uh, yeah, currently. because because the the, the uh, people maybe are afraid to say, oh, by first of October, uh, if I don't have a lab that can do the test for me, then I cannot sell my device anymore. Whatever I think, yeah. it's like description oh. of uh, products on the market. The, the, there's no worry about this one. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Great. Yes. Um. So as we said, after your 100th certificate, now can you maybe provide um some pitfalls that happens or maybe some tips to people what they have maybe to uh, be well prepared maybe also for notified bodies to be uh, acting correctly or quickly because maybe you have some uh, some tips for them so is there some a list of like things that you maybe would recommend for the manufacturers now yeah i mean uh, what we have for the class d's 
um, uh, are, uh, if existing, the common specifications. I mean, this is a set of basically performance parameters uh, and uh, uh, which need to be followed. Yeah, so that makes it uh, on the on the other hand side uh, fairly easy because both manufacturer and notified body are very clear about what is needed and what is required. Yeah, so um, for a class C or for a class D device, that is not always that clear. Né? So in a sense. Um, it is a bit easier for class Ds because you know the set of requirements is 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 clear and um, where we have uh, sometimes um, a bit of a surprise is when we come uh, from uh, legacy devices which were uh, list A under IVDD. Um, so base these devices should follow the common technical specifications, which is basically the same like the common specifications. And um, in most of the cases, this is uh, also okay and running fine. But we have actually seen sometimes that uh, for those devices, uh, uh, CTS have not been uh, completely fulfilled. And that is a kind of a surprise. So um, manufacturer um, should be really uh, carefully looking at that if they have such a legacy device and apply for a new notified body that the CTS uh, or common specifications then uh, under the IVDR are really fully uh, yeah, um, satisfied. Uh, what, uh, what else is um, difficult is, or where we see sometimes issues is uh, with the performance evaluations. Okay. Um, yeah, but also that is, uh, yeah. Um, is it a new requirement that, or it's a... Uh, it no, no, it's not, yeah, it's not, a, it's, it's a general requirement, of course, with the IVDR that you, that you need to have a more stringent, you know, documentation of, uh, of the performance uh, of the device, yeah. And uh, naturally, there are then uh, sometimes problems. And uh, I mentioned this already in the beginning, um, uh, difficulty is... Uh, often seen when we have uh, upclassified devices from uh, maybe self-declaration to class D um, and where we don't have um, then um, um, common specifications, such kind of devices, uh, they, they need to go then uh, to the expert panel and there we will then receive uh, yeah, comments from the expert panels and recommendations uh, in cases, um, yeah, uh, some improvements need to be done on certain aspects of the, of the, yeah. Hey, just a second. Do you need a EU, Swiss or UK representative? Then choose Easy Medical Device. We can represent you and also become your importer. Contact us at eo at easymedicaldevice.com. Um, of the uh, documentation. Can you explain maybe uh, again what are the expert panels? Is it something be 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 uh, in part of the notified, notified body or it's extra notified body or how it's no. working? This the the expert panels are named by the MDG, MDCG, I suppose, um, and uh, so it's not a part of the notified body, but they are uh, form an uh, independent uh, sign, uh, scientific panel basically um, who uh, looks then at the uh, uh, performance evaluation and gives then a recommendation on uh, on um, on a, a potentially uh, you know uh, improvements or, or the additional gaps to fill and so on and so forth so these expert panels need to be consulted in case uh, we don't have common specifications available uh, one or it is a, a new type of device yeah so uh, once, uh, let's say, an expert panel has consulted for a certain type, then uh, uh, manufacturers can look at the assessment reports and basically use this as a guidance, you know, for their own performance evaluation and for their own technical documentation, uh, what to consider and how to set up um, the uh, the clinical studies, for instance. Yeah. So we have... We and, and these um, reports uh, from the expert panels, they are publicly available. Yeah. Uh, so far, we have 22, I believe. And uh, it's, uh, it's very helpful and useful for manufacturers to look at them. 
Yeah, I agree with you because I, I looked at some of them and yeah, it gives you some hints of what they are looking for, what are the things that can pass or not pass and, and helping you to understand yes. uh, mainly the, the guidance. I mean, it, it's, it's people are, are doing, I mean, as it's public, uh, people, maybe competitors are making some maybe mistakes that you can learn from and then... <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, it's very helpful. Exactly, yeah, it's very good. I mean, um, um, yes, indeed. And it's it's also something that, uh, for for example, so uh, in terms of expert panel, they can provide a recommendation. Is it something that notified bodies are obliged to follow? Or it's really just a, a recommendation. <laughs> I think the regulation says the notified body should consider that uh, okay. or take it into consideration. But uh, I mean, in reality, they will follow it, of course. Okay, yeah. so if the recommendation is rejection and we we, we are not accepting this, etc., usually they come when they say there is a rejection, they come with also some recommendation of improvements or whatever. So it's not like just we reject, they are really providing also some uh, some ideas of where you should really yeah. uh, improve yourself. I don't think we have seen any rejections there. I think we have seen some uh, areas for improvement and so on, and uh, but but not a real rejection. Yeah. I saw just, I think, one or two rejections on the MDR side for uh, expert panel on the MDR side, but mm -hmm. not for uh, the IVDR, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. it's the same It's I the see. same also for MDR. We have also the high-risk devices that have to be looked at. Are all legacy devices also subject to expert panel? Or if my device, I'm selling that since now 20 years, I mean, uh, I still have to go through expert panel? I mean, no, no. I mean, for class Ds, I mean, when we have common specifications, yeah, then uh, there's no expert panel needed, yeah. Or if already this kind of device uh, has been uh, reviewed once uh, by an expert panel, then uh, we don't need to do it a second time, yeah. So uh, it's always when it is uh, no common specifications or the first type of a device. I mean, legacy device or not, that doesn't uh, play a role. I mean, uh, there may be tests which have been on the market as a self-declared for already many years, but it has never been had the scrutiny of a third party, yeah, of a notified body or expert panel. So, um, therefore, legacy or not, that doesn't uh, it doesn't matter in this case. Yeah. So we have some class D devices that were not classified before, which are like some companion diagnostics, for example, that are used with uh, some some drugs. Uh, so these devices are. Uh, combination of a drug, I mean, uh, working with a drug so uh, for, for the section. So is this also something that has a lot of scrutiny with uh, with notified bodies like Chief Sud or with expert panel or this kind of thing? So is this something that is more on focus now? So the companion diagnostics, uh, they are generally uh, not class D, but class Cs uh, usually. Yeah. So and the companion diagnostic is um, uh, defined as as a device assisting uh, the uh, you know use of a pharmaceutical yeah and uh, for example helping you to dose uh, a, a pharmaceutical correctly and so on and so forth so that is usually uh, uh, there uh, there's a collaboration with the EMA the European Medicines Agency who will look at the um, um, IFU and uh, of the SSP. Um, uh, and uh, that is also going uh, on. I mean, we have uh, we have issued a number of uh, companion diagnostic uh, certificates, um, and uh, yeah, I don't think uh, there is a major problem. Certainly not with this high number. So uh, this is uh, there are not too many uh, applications ongoing, um, but uh, we have issued, I think, the first uh, CDX. Uh, certificate also i don't know one or one and a half years ago i don't remember that exactly is there yeah. any any type of device that is uh, class d that has most of the issues if i can say or when you see that this type of device will be coming uh <laughs> you'll see oh i'm sure there will be this type of issue with those devices yeah i mean again this is uh, uh these uh upclassified uh self-declared devices, yeah, which were not list A uh, before, um, and then uh, the experience of the manufacturer. I mean, these are the two factors uh, which influence it most, yeah? whether whether we have, uh, you know, it takes longer to get through the conformity assessment or not. So okay. so this is really, um, yeah, um, these are the key, key factors. 
And f for you, for Tuve Sud mainly, so actually you are still, I mean, we have, uh, you remember before we had the rumor saying, oh, we don't have, uh, people, uh, notified boys don't have enough uh, resources, uh, it takes a long lead time to uh, for the application, etc. So what's the situation now? Maybe for Tuve Sud, because you maybe know, don't know the situation for others, but... Uh, uh, yeah, no, I mean... Go through, through your process... Uh, it's a, no, no. I mean, this is long over these times. I mean, uh, we are, of course, uh, in, in, in discussion also with other notified bodies. I mean, we meet on conferences and talk. And I mean, this is a long, uh, I think, since beginning of 2023. So last year, beginning of last year, I think all notify, all the bigger notified bodies have sufficient capacity to take on on clients. Yeah? And I mean, there's always uh, people say, yeah, I mean, I've heard. And uh, of somebody and somewhere, you know, but I mean, personally, you know, uh, on, on the conferences uh, I've been attending in the last two years, I've never met a single person who told me they couldn't get a notified body for their device. Yeah? Some people have said, yeah, I know of somebody somewhere, yeah? but I mean, that I have met a manufacturer who told me, hey, Andreas, uh, um, um, you have rejected our our uh, application because you don't have capacity. I mean, that is a thing of the past. I mean, we were struggling, yeah, but that that is uh, definitely over. Yeah. So okay, so uh, and and now, how many notified bodies are available for uh, for IVDR? Oh, uh, you know, my I have changed. Uh, I, I'm not uh, fully responsible for IVD anymore at Tube Suit, but I think we have a double digit number now, 10 or 11, like, I believe. Right? I think 12, 12, if I remember for the last number. Yeah, but could be. Yeah, so 12, we, yes. we think that now 12 is sufficient. I think uh, under IVDD, there was 18, maybe, if I remember, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. So we think now 12 is sufficient then. Yeah, I mean, I, I it's think, not, it's, I think it's know, not the number of notified bodies, more the no. resources of the notified the, body that is really yeah. mattering here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there are a number of fairly big ones. I mean, uh, we have, we have, a, of course, quite a big number of experts. Um, there are smaller ones. I do expect uh, more notified bodies to come online. Yeah. So um, I do believe uh, that we are uh, that we are good with the uh, with the capacity. I think uh, where we need to maybe adjust is uh, some of the procedural aspects of the IVDR where things are maybe a little bit too complicated same with the MDR where we can uh, where we can uh, do uh, things a little bit more straightforward but when it comes to the notified body capacities um, that is uh, not an issue anymore great any last advice maybe to people that are listening well um i think uh, uh, last advice is just yeah uh, uh, keep this uh, when we talk about class d's keep the deadline or this, uh, this date of 1st of October in the back of your mind. I mean, yeah. you do yourself a favor if you submit your application before that. Yeah. And then uh, watch out uh, the channel of Easy Medical Device and maybe of others on LinkedIn uh, to uh, keep up to date. Exactly. Yeah. So let's uh, let's keep informing people about uh, those, uh, those, in, those uh, deadlines and everything so that they are... Um on top of it and i hope yeah they will be uh, getting a lot of uh, advice from you and following them mainly so that they are not in trouble in future okay andreas it was really a pleasure to have you on the podcast thank you very much and i wish you a nice day yeah thank you you're welcome you too bye, bye.